Good morning and welcome to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. My name is Bill Benson. I am the host of the museum's public program, First Person. Thank you for joining us. We are in our 17th year of the First Person program. And our first person today is Mrs. Anna Gross, whom we shall meet shortly. This 2016 season of First Person is made possible by the generosity of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. We are grateful for their sponsorship. First Person is a series of conversations with survivors of the Holocaust who share with us their firsthand accounts of their experience during the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as volunteers here in this, at this museum. Our program will continue twice weekly through mid-August. The museum's website, which is listed on the back of your program, provides information about each of our upcoming first person guests. The web address is www.ushmm.org. Anyone interested in keeping in touch with the museum and its programs can complete the Stay Connected card that's in your program or speak with a museum representative at the back of the theater. In doing so, you will receive an electronic copy of Anna Gross's biography so that you can remember and share her testimony when you leave here today. Anna will share her first person account of her experience during the Holocaust and as a survivor for about 45 minutes. If time allows, we will have an opportunity for you to ask Anna questions uh, toward the end of the program. Today's program will be live streamed on the museum's website. This means people will be joining the program via a link from the museum's website and watching with us today from across the country and around the world. A recording of this program will be made available on the museum's website. And we invite those of you who are in the auditorium today to join us on the web when the rest of our programs in April will be live streamed. Please visit the First Person website listed on the back of your program for more details. For our web audience, if you would like to use Twitter to ask a question, send a picture, or write a comment during the program, please feel free to do so using hashtag USHMM. That's hashtag USHMM. The life stories of Holocaust survivors transcend the decades. What you are about to hear from Anna is one individual's account of the Holocaust. We have prepared a brief slide presentation to help with her introduction. Anna Gross was born into a Jewish family on April 20th, 1926 in Rockshaw, Transylvania, a part of Romania, as Anna Zilfroin. Anna celebrated her 90th birthday yesterday. The arrow on this map points to Raksha. These photos taken in 1919 show Anna's parents, Samuel and Alona Zielfreund. Samuel owned a vineyard and was a wine merchant while Alona cared for Anna and her five sisters. In 1940, Raksha fell under Hungarian rule. Jewish people in Raksha became subject to anti-Semitic laws. Under the new laws, Anna's father's vineyard was confiscated and he was conscripted into the Hungarian labor service. Samuel never returned home. This photo from 1943 shows Anna and her sisters. In order from left to right is Clara, Elizabeth, Margaret, Margaret's daughter Suzanne, Violet, Anna, and Gisela. In March 1944, Nazi Germany occupied Hungary. Hungarian officials agreed to turn over hundreds of thousands of Hungarian Jews to the custody of the Germans. Anna, her sisters, and her mother were placed into the Satu Mori ghetto, indicated by the circle on this map, and then deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz is indicated by our blue arrow on this map. Nazi authorities selected Anna and three of her sisters for forced labor while they sent her mother and two other sisters to the gas chambers. In June 1944, Anna and her remaining three sisters were sent to Stutthof concentration camp, indicated here with the red arrow. Later, they were transferred to Proust, a subcamp of Stutthof. 
In February 1945, the SS evacuated most of the prisoners, including Anna's three sisters, marching them on foot. Soviet troops liberated them around March 11, 1945. Anna was left behind with other injured and sick prisoners because she'd previously broken her leg. On March 23, 1945, Soviet troops liberated some 600 prisoners, including Anna. Anna later reunited with her sisters, Gisela and Clara, and found out that her sister, Elizabeth, had been shot during the forced march. And we close with this photograph of Anna in 1946. Anna would remain in Romania until emigrating to the United States. Anna, together with her husband, Emery Gross, and their two young sons, Alex and Andrew, were allowed, after much difficulty, to leave Romania and begin their life in the United States. They settled in New York, where Emery went to work as a fabric cutter in New York City's garment district. Anna found work as a seamstress in a clothing factory, working with fellow Hungarian-speaking Holocaust survivors and refugees. Anna worked at the same place for the next 27 years, driving two and a half hours to and from work each day. After finishing high school, their two sons attended university and went on to very successful careers and are now retired. Alex was an attorney at the U.S. Patent Office. Andrew was a geologist for the federal government. Anna has four grandchildren and a five-year-old great-grandson. After the retirement, Anna and Emery moved to the Washington, D.C. area in 2003. Anna's husband suffered a stroke in, two, in 1999, and Anna cared for him until he passed away in 2009. She also was the caregiver for one of her sisters prior to her death and then for her hu sister's husband. Anna now volunteers with this museum's visitor services. You will find her at the visitor's desk on Tuesdays from 10 a.m. till 2 p.m. Anna has spoken about her Holocaust experience to children at local schools. For example, she recently spoke to 500 students at a high school in West Virginia. Anna's son, Alex, and his wife, Carla, and Anna's niece, Suzanne, are here with Anna today. Suzanne also volunteers here at the museum. And with that, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming our first person, Mrs. Anna Gross. Anna, thank you so much for being willing to join us today and be our first person. And we have so much for you to share with us, and we really have so little time, so we'll start, we'll start right away. You were just 13, Anna, when World War II began with Germany's invasion of Poland on September 1st, 1939. Before we turn to all that happened to you and your family during the war and the Holocaust, Let's start first with you telling us a little bit about your family, your community, and you in the years before the war began. Yes. Hello, first, friends. Thank you for coming to listen to my story. But I have to tell that Bill made a mistake. I am not 90 because I turned the nine to a six like this. <laughs> so I'm 60, not 90. <laughs> <laughs> I have a short time to tell my story, but I'm going to try to take just the essence from that. In one year, what we lived through, the family and all of us Jewish people, is unbelievable. The torture and the humiliation and something that I sometimes think that, am I still normal? I doubt that sometimes, you know. So before the war, we had a nice family life. My father was a 
wine merchant. We have, I had five sisters, so we were six girls. Uh, the older girls went to high school, and the younger girls uh, were in school. I was only 14 years old when the Hungarian occupied uh, Transylvania. Everybody will know this way because that's what they make the horror movies <laughs> from Transylvania. And uh, the first thing what they did, it was that they stopped the Jewish people to go to high school. So that was the first tragedy for me because I couldn't go to high school, like my older sisters. Uh, Anna, after that... Anna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you just a couple of questions before we go there, if you don't mind. And I, I know, I hope later you'll talk more about what that loss of education meant to you, but your father, he'd been a decorated soldier in the First World War, hadn't he? Yes, he was, but... In the First World War, he was hung in Hungary. Mm -hmm. And because the Germans lost the war then in the First World War also, mm -hmm. it became Romania. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened in the Second World War because the Hungarians were allied with the Germans. Mm -hmm. They gave it back to the Hungarians. Mm -hmm. So that's why he became Hungarians again. My father married my mother in Romania, so he remained in Romania. Anna, you're... So, as I said before, we leave... One, one more question. Yes. You're, you're, you told me that your parents, both your mother and father, were very respected members of the community. Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I could say that, that they were very honored people because my father was very correct man. Uh, everybody who bought the wine and the uh, brandy for, from him, they bought it in advance because they knew that he will deliver it 100% what he sold. So uh, my parents, what I have, I have no school education, but I, what I have, I have it from my parents and my very strict grandmother who was, very uh, strict with us, they taught us manners and discipline. So when he died, I wasn't so sorry for her because I did not like what he wanted me to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me go back to the family life that we had. We lived in peace, everybody had her job, uh, my older sisters in school, Gisela did not go to school because we had a little business at home also, a textile uh, store. And I helped out my father with uh, going to the vineyard and, and arrange for workers and everything. One day, we did not know anything was happening in the world. We had two stations on the radio, Budapest and Bucharest. We did not know what happened in the war that it, the Germans occupied in 33 already, Germany or something, nothing about the war. Only when they occupied uh, Transylvania and then changed everything, schools, offices, everything in Hungarian from Romania. Not long after that started that they took away the license from the store. They did not let Jewish people out without the yellow star. Uh, they couldn't uh, keep uh, non-Jewish help. So all like one uh, to the other, it became that we were not allowed even go to the street without that yellow star. In May the 4th, the uh, Transylvania was occupied on uh, March. Uh, the, thir the 4th March, 140, I mean. 1940. 1940. 
1944. Mm -hmm. In 1944, Hungary was the last country that the Germans occupied from the whole Europe. In 1940, so uh, when they did all these things to us that they did not let us out, humiliation, even a gypsy said there that I am what I am, but I am not a Jew. So we were totally humiliated and that's, I don't know, to me that's even worse than suffering, the humiliation. And Anna, after the, after the Hungarians did all these terrible things to you, they took away your family business, they took away the textile business. They took business. away everything. How, how, did your, how did your family, you had a lot of mouths to feed, how did your family manage to, to, to My make father it? took care of that before. We had uh, flowers, we had bread, we had, uh, and we had uh, brandy that we sold mm -hmm. because we had a brandy machine also, a uh, steel they call it, mm -hmm. and we sold that and we, we lived from that. It was enough even to help other people. Mm -hmm. So it came the day, May the 4th, and uh, family by family, they took all of us in the synagogue. And they said that we can take food with us for four days. And Anna, so, do you mind if I just go back and ask you a sure. couple of your questions? Before that happened, your father was conscripted into <laughs> one of the Hungarian labor battalions. Yes. Tell us, tell us about that. Well, the worst thing was that, the first thing and the worst thing was that they took for um, forced labor all the young men from about 18 till 45 or so. They took all the men who was the, the, the heart of the people and remained there the children and the old people with, with the young people and they took them to labs, uh, worse labor to uh, in the country and also I think in other parts of Hungary and they work they work so hard and they they torture them I don't know I still don't have the the answer for that if they wanted to kill us because we were the enemy, the Jewish people, why did they have to torture us before that? Why did they do that before the killing? You know, one example who did not happen to me but to my husband. It was two uh, uh, Jewish people there who were uh, forced laborers and a Hungarian uh, soldier who was the guard with them said, you say that you are a stinky Jew. And they said, the man said, why should I say that? And he said, because I told you so. So he said, if you don't say that, that you are a stinky Jew, I'm gonna beat you. So he said, he went to the other people and he said, you say that, you say also that you are a stinky Jew. And he said, why should I say that? I am a college professor. If you don't say that, I'm gonna beat you. He did not say that. And he started to beat him until he was half dead. Then he said, I am a stinky Jew. So this is a similar uh, uh, humiliation happened, uh, which I can't say all of them, but it happened. Anna, Let me go back because I... I you're, yes, you're gonna tell us about your father. They took him away and you never saw him again. My father was uh, sent in a camp. He was a translator for a while from German to Hungarian. And he sent a postcard for us near Budapest, was a, a camp 
and you, ne you never heard after that of him. What happened to him? We didn't know what happened. After we were taken, the whole, uh, the whole little town who, were, who lived 50 Jewish people, Jewish family, they took us in the synagogue and we stayed there for about two or three days. And that synagogue, the children and the old people sleeping on the floor, it was a terrible thing and we didn't know why and what's gonna happen after that. After four days, they put us in carriages. Every, uh, the non-Jewish people had to carry us about seven, 37 kilometers from our homes in a ghetto where was uh, only Jewish people could live there. They took the houses from non-Jewish people to have room there. We didn't stay too long there. And then they said, take food for four days with you. And we still didn't know what happens, but I shouldn't say that a surprise, it was a shock to us because it came only that we didn't know what happened before that in the world. So in the ghetto, we stayed there for about sleeping, uh, sleeping on the floors and chill, mostly children and old women because men were not there. And after four days, they took uh, I don't know how many people, they took them to the train station and they put them in a wagon there. And when they took our family, I was the 92nd in that, in that wagon. We didn't know where is my mother, where is my sister, because we, they pushed us in. And, uh, it was a barrel in the corner of the wagon, and who had to go out, they did it there. From time to time, the wagon opened to empty that, that barrel. But to stay four days in that, in that train, the children cried, the old men prayed, some of them cursed, why did this happen to us? Uh, it was, I tried to take one of my most terrible days from the whole deportation or that life. I, don't, I thought is that one, the traveling four days and after that they let us out in Auschwitz. Uh, yeah. Later I find out that not that was the most terrible uh, day in my life. They let us out, it was at night. We were all busy and didn't know what happened to us. Neon uh, light there, uh, dogs barking, low, slow, slow, the German soldiers that meant fast, fast, fast. And they took us to a place that, and the music played. Jewish music players, they played the music. They wanted the, the chaos make it a little bit more supported. So they took us to a door there and a German officer came with a stick. And uh, my sister had my older sister's baby, three years old girl in her hand, and it came a man to her and he asked, is this your baby? And she said, no. And then she said, give it to her mother because if a baby take away from the mother, they try to cry. Mm -hmm. So she gave it back to the mother, but if she wouldn't be warned that give it back, then she would have to go in the left side when the people were killed. They didn't even make a difference whether one will live or one will die. 
So my mother, my older sister with the baby, and my youngest sister, 14 years old, was uh, taken to one side. And Elizabeth, my older sister, 25. Gisela, 20. I was 18. Clara was 16 in another side. And they took us in a room. And first of all, we had to take off our clothes and then sit in a chair and they, uh, they um, took us or cut off our hairs and anywhere that we had hair. I don't know what I felt because I don't think that I felt any, anything because I was so tired from that four days traveling in that train. What happened to me, it happened. I couldn't comprehend what happened. So all the four of our sisters were taken in another room where we were disinfected with some white uh, uh, dust. And after that, we got a gray dress with a number on the sleeve because they did not have time to tattooate us like other people were being tattooed because we were the last people who were occupied and, and deported. Hungary was the last and, country. And you told me, Anna, that it, because there were just so many coming in for Hungary, they just didn't have the time to tattoo you. And so that's yes, why that's what they did not have. Uh, because there's so many, the last one so was many. Hungarian. Right. Less, the last country was Hungarian. Many places already, the war, the war was over already, but they still put the Jewish people in trains and deported to Auschwitz. And many places, that's what Hungary did. They were already liberated someplace because it was in 1944 and 45 was over, right? So, we were in Auschwitz there, yes, they put us in, they slept, we slept in a stall there, and one person came and she said, you were chosen, she was from Czechoslovakia, she was there for four years already in the concentration camp. She spoke Hungarian also, and we asked her, what's happening to us, where are our parents? And, our, and she said, you see that uh, smoke? There are your parents. It was very close. The Auschwitz block when we lived, size 12, to that crematorium. And we thought that she is crazy. What? She didn't even know the word, what crematorium is. And how about Berlin? that they killed there in the crematorium. Just we didn't believe her. We said that she's a bad person, that's all. So they took us in Auschwitz, put us in some beds where are no uh, uh, covering or something just, and every day we had to stay sail up there. They counted us in the morning and at night, and the food was Terrible, terrible. Some beets and uh, some other greens cooked and uh, a little piece of margarine in the morning and a very small piece of bread. And we had to stay in the line. And always when we stayed in the line at night and in the morning, they, did, uh, they chose people who was very skinny, who was very fat. They just took them away. We never heard of them again. Just remained the people who were strong looking uh, for them. But they always did that selection all the time when we were there. So one day said that we choose people for work. And we were so happy for sisters and a few 
other girls from the town that he go for work anywhere but not stay here. So they chose us for, for work. All four of us, we had to hide Elizabeth, my older sister, because she was skinnier than uh, the, the three of us and smaller. So they chose us for work, uh, 800 of us who looked fit to work, that's what they said. They took us to a Stutthof where we stayed uh, one day and by the train they took us there and we saw the sun and we saw the nature. Oh, we thought, thought what a nice thing that we, we presented us to, I mean, to, to go to work. We, we applied, <laughs> better said. So when we arrived in Stutthof, they did again the, uh, the selections. We were not all good for work, but the four of us still remained there, the sisters. Anna, just I'm gonna jump in for just yes. a minute. In addition, you would line up five in a row and besides you and your three sisters, there was a fifth woman who stayed, yes. who stayed with you throughout. We right? had to stay fi five in a row. Mm -hmm. So we had one person there who had nobody there, no sisters, nobody. She's still alive. Uh, 94 years old, and she has the dimension. The, the, the dimension, yes. So, so, they, so from Stuttgart, they took you to a place called Proust, yes, which was a brand new camp. Yes, they took us to Proust, which before was a big farm. The fa the the place was not ready yet to work, so we had to. It was terrible hot. It was near Danzig, near Danzig, and the sun was burning. And who had a short sleeve dress, a short dress, we had to go to a place and fill the straw sacks. Did I say it right? Sack. A sack? With, uh, that would be in our bed. All day long we had to do that, and some girls did put some paper on their legs to cover it, and in the paper was cement. So when they took it off, it came off with the skin. Uh, and what did they do? They sent it back to Stutthof because they couldn't work anymore, and they brought new people there instead of them. Of course, we never heard of them, because in Stutthof was another crematorium. Anna, you told me that it was always 800 women, as you were saying, so if some were ill, they sent them back and then they would bring back the same number, so you had 800. And then you were forced to do exceptionally hard labor. Tell us about that. Well, we had to do uh, airport from that, from that uh, big, uh, you were forced to build For, an airfield, right? Yes. So we had to take first the vegetable from that farm. It was carrots, beets mostly, and a few potatoes. And we were told that can, we cannot take from there to eat because we are going to be punished for that if we do that. But we were very hungry because in the First day when we arrived, there was no food, no water. The water was rusty, so we couldn't drink or eat. And some people still took a carrot and ate it, or, or a potato or something. But the number was here on the sleeve, and the guards saw that, then took the number, and at night when we went home from uh, work, the guard gave it to, there were two women, I think they were at least 250 or 30 pounds. That was their job, to do the punishment and also to uh, the food, arrange the food for us. So in the first night, the guard give, gave the number 
because the, the girls took the food. And uh, the punishment was like that. She had to bend off and the two uh, devils came, I don't know uh, how to call them, and they gave 25 lashes on the ba back of them, and next day they had to present for work, no matter how they felt. That was the first day we didn't know what the punishment will be. So the work started, the, our work was to fill with uh, sand. The, the, a train came, filled the, the cars, and another train came, and another all day we had to fill those cars with, with uh, sand. So just to be sure I, we all understand, you were filling train cars full of sand. That was your job, to fill sand. It was not full of sand. For example, my sister Clara could not work as hard because she was 16 like us. Then he, we had to work harder to be full that be full. car. Mm -hmm. It's not a car. I don't know how to say that in English. It's, it looks like this somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like this. Yeah. That doesn't matter. And the sand was used then to make the to base? To make the pavement, yes. Make the pavement. And French uh, war prisoners were far away from us and they built the hangar to, to go the, uh, the airplanes in at night. I don't know, they still have it here too. I never saw it till then. So that's what happened. We, were, we had this work with very little food. We all lost weight and in uh, that what we did all, all summer. Then we had a guard with us. Uh, there were many guards, but one we had from Romania. We spoke to him Romanian. He was a nice guy. And he never gave a number to the German woman who was his girlfriend. But he never gave the, but the other guards, they gave the number, and almost every day we had somebody get punished. But we had to stay and see the punishment like this, with hands up, and we did not have the dinner until all the people was inside come out and get the dinner. That, I don't know, that was a sadist uh, thing to do. I don't know why, I repeat again, why did they have to torture us before they kill us? I don't know that. Many things I don't know. So finally, I have to make the, my story short. It came cri Christmas time, and they wanted us to entertain them. So they provide a piano, a, a, a violin, and there were many talented people, opera singers, and uh, m many, uh, and they said everybody should go who has a talent. I left out something. That Romanian uh, soldier, uh, somehow he regretted, but he had to go in the army, in the German army. He liked me to sing for him Romanian songs poplars and ballads and every time he was with us, he let if he wanted me to sing for him. For him. That time I had a very pretty voice uh, inherited from my mother. So the Christmas, uh, the Christmas party came and all the people were there and, uh, and presented what they do and I was sitting in the top of a bed, in a bank bed there. I was just watching. And then that Romanian uh, soldier came to me and he said, why did you come to sing also? I wanted you to sing Romanian also. And I said, I don't think that I was such a talent to go there. But he said, I want you to come. And he uh, let me, uh, to help go you down up to from, uh, go down from that bed, and I fall, 
and I, I broke my leg. Now, with the smallest sickness, they sent it back the people to, uh, to Stutthof because they needed another people who is able to work, who was sick for two days, they sent it back. Now I thought this is my end because with a broken leg, what can they do? So my sister begged this officer, or it was a soldier, I think, to not send me back to Stutthof. And because he somehow felt uh, guilty because he wanted me to go to sing mm -hmm. and the one who decided to uh, send back people because it, it was his girlfriend, the, the big woman who did the punishment. So they put it as a miracle that they put my leg in cast. Never happened, never heard of any miracle like this. So they put my leg in cast for in the morning my leg became like this swollen. They had to take it off and put another a cast. Uh, no injection or put me to sleep or something. But I survived, I don't know. A human being can survive everything. I think his own death also <laughs> can survive. I think I'm never gonna die. I'm gonna survive my death too. <laughs> so, um, so Anna, af after you broke your leg and, and this miracle occurred that they, they, they put a cast on you, it wasn't long after that that then they emptied Proust and... Three weeks after that started that they, they uh, took the people from all camps do to t take to march the the uh, the because um, crematorium could not destroy them the last because the war was very short to end so all the people had to march away from the camp and it uh, when uh, the time came that our camp had to leave i couldn't walk so they took off my shoes because other 26 people were chosen who could not uh, march and a few guards and the people who cooked there because other uh, camps came, came other, and stayed there for a night and after that they marched further. So when our our uh, camp, it was the time to march. My three sisters were able to march, but I wasn't able with the other 26 people who couldn't walk. You were, you were left behind. I was left behind, taken off my shoes, because I don't need shoes, because the 26 unable to walk people are going to be killed there. I didn't even was afraid. I, yes, they put some in our food that they didn't let us think it called brome, a medication or something. So we couldn't even clear, think it clear. They left me there. I thought, my, see, I'm going to stay here by myself and killed, and my three sisters left. I couldn't even try. I was sitting there. And the second miracle happened to me. One miracle wa was that they put my leg in cast, which never, never, nowhere happened. And then a girl came who worked in the kitchen, and she asked me, could you do some sewing? And I said, yes. My mother wanted all of us to learn some sewing. And then she said, we are making some civilian clothes for the, uh, for the SS, the German people, and if you can sew, you come with us and you will do that job. And she provided me shoes, 
and I was, I survived my death because they took me there and I did the sewing with that, with, with those. So what happened, the camps, all night they came from other camps, but they, they marched for a long time already. Every day died, I don't know how many people, and they made a big hole, a big, big hole, and just throw them, throw them there in that hole. And that, when the time came, that our uh, German people wanted to go, the guards, and then the girl who I helped with the sewing came to me, and she said, you stay here because you're gonna be liberated. We have to go with them. They want us to go with them. So our camp left also, and I remained there, and uh, for two days it was quiet. And then we heard that the whole airport was blown up, but we did, because it was bombed from one place to the other and in a wire, and they blew out the whole. So the Germans uh, blew up their own airfield. The field, whole right. airport, and a black also blew out with that, who were people who couldn't walk. They were dead also. But I could already die, uh, walk a little bit and a few other people, and we walked and hide it in the basement where they used to keep the food. So for another two days it was quiet, and we had the uh, God, somebody came out from the basement, and I came out also, and I felt very dizzy, and I saw from far away two dots. And those two dots became bigger and bigger, and then became two Russian soldiers. So that meant that we were liberated, became, became more Russian soldiers. But when I came out from that basement, I was dizzy, I was sick, so I got the typhus there in the basement. And Russian people did not care too much of us because they still were searching for Germans uh, there. But they took me in, I don't know, I really couldn't think. I woke up in a, in a house, they told her this is a hospital, and I was stayed there, I don't know, maybe two weeks or so, I didn't know what happened to me. When I woke up, I saw a, uh, a Russian nurse dead near me. She died of typhus. And no hair again. They cut my hair the second time, which my hair grew uh, in, in a year there. And I was, and they, they gave me some clothes because they took my old clothes which was full with lies, even in the, I never knew that in a cloak can be lies also. But in a hair, I didn't think that I have lies because I was working with those people. But they, want, they took off my hair. And they gave me uh, an outfit. I, I would still like to see a skirt like a sack and a blouse. And just nothing on my head. And they said, now you can go. So go, now I was liberated. And what and can, and Anna, yeah. Um, in, the sh in the little time we have left, one of the things you said to me is, even though you were liberated, you didn't feel happy at all. And yes, but I said, no, well, I am, uh, I'm, I'm getting there. Mm -hmm. I was, out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. I was out from that hospital and I saw, I never saw a mirror uh, the whole year, but I saw myself in a, a window and I looked at myself 
you know, lost weight in that outfit that I had and no hair. And I think I started to let. That was my first let that I saw the way I look. And I go somewhere. So I, I didn't know where to go. I heard somewhere music. The Polish people and the French uh, uh, war prisoners started to celebrate the peace. It was March the 23rd, 1st. And then I heard music, which I didn't hear. Music is still my life. So I went to hear the music. I didn't know how I look or something. And I was sitting like this. And once somebody came at my back and she sa he said, Mademoiselle. Then I had the second laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Mademoiselle, me. So <laughs> a, a French prisoner came and I turned my, and he asked me to dance, <laughs> to go to dance. And then I started to cry, you know. So I spoke Hungarian, he spoke French, but we understood each other. He found out who I am and I found who is his. And, but I didn't go to dance with him. And then later he came with a pack of cigarettes and a piece of bread. And he said also in French, French is a little bit similar to Romanian. And I understand that, that if I want, he would take me to Paris, to France. And I thought, yes, that's what I want to do now, to go to France. So I didn't know where my sisters are. I knew, unfortunately, that is true, but I did not want to, to believe that my, my parents are still in, uh, uh, there in the smoke. And all of a sudden, people just went around all the people who was liberated. And once a girl come to me and looks at me long and she said, don't you have a sister, Gisela? And I said, yes, I do have. And one Clara, I was with them in Putzig, that's what I remember the word. I never know where I put my keys, but I remember <laughs> what happened then, and everything I remember. I could go with closed eyes and find my bed or, or anything that happened there. So she said, your sisters are liberated. And she said, Clara and Gisela, and how about Elizabeth, I asked. She said sh she was shot on the day when she was marching on the day of the liberation. Then the Germans shot her because she couldn't walk. So I find out that two of my, the whole family are alive. I had to believe that this was true. I did not want to believe and I did not want to leave. I didn't know where my sisters are, even if they are alive. We went from one train station to the other who were liberated and Nobody helped us, not with food, not with going home. I thought that an airplane will come and take us home. <laughs> but for two months did not come an airplane. We were just wandering there. And nobody cared of us at all. And I am thinking which was my most terrible day in my life. It's hard to find one because there are more, more terrible days in my life. But the most terrible day was when my two sisters came home. We met in our empty house, a robbed house, knowing that it's true that we are just the three of us young girls, not trained for life, not knowing what to start with our lives. Just leave and how. 
and they were another problem. They were no men to marry them because they all were uh, killed in the uh, forced labor. And another terrible thing happened to me that I saw in a person my mother's dress on the street. I got hysterical inside in my empty house, but I couldn't go out or say something to her. After that, when we started a new life, in we had, by, the, by the time <coughs> Oh, I thought this is brandy. It's just, <laughs> this is just water. You cheated me. I, I have the brandy. <laughs> oh, I could talk another three hours. <laughs> the, Anna, we, we, we are gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna close the program in just a moment, and um, um, we'll soon be toward the. We'll be at the close of our program uh, shortly. We do have time for just a couple of questions. Um, I want you to know that, that it is our tradition at first person that our first person has the last word. So before we finish, I'm going to turn back to Anna again to close our program. Needless to say, we were only able to just catch a glimpse of all that Anna could have shared with us, and we could have had you talk for three, three more days. And what oh we yeah. don't, and what we, <laughs> and, and what we don't even begin to touch upon is what happened after the war not only immediately after the war, the circumstances that Anna began to describe for us, getting married, and then spending the next 19 years <coughs> living under communist rule before Anna and her two sons were, and, 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 and family were able to, um, to leave um, and come to the United States. And that we, we could have a whole afternoon just beginning to touch on that. So um, I'm gonna ask you, if you would please um, stay seated with us because Anna will get the last word and we want you to hear what she has to say. After Anna concludes the program, I'm gonna ask you all to stand because our photographer Joel is gonna take a picture of Anna with you as the backdrop and so that makes for a wonderful photograph for Anna and for all of us. And then Anna, when she's done, she will remain on the stage here. So please absolutely feel free afterwards to come up and ask her a question shake her hands, give her a hug, take a photograph, whatever you'd like to do. I wanna first thank all of you for being with us today. Remind you, we'll have a first person program each Wednesday and Thursday through the middle of August. So we hope that you can come back. Also for the, our remaining programs in April, we'll live stream them so you'll have an opportunity to also hear them over the internet. We hope that you do. So very briefly, we have time for a couple of questions and I'm gonna turn first uh, to a question from our Twitter audience. Um, and as I'm doing that, I'd ask that if anybody would like to ask a question, and we'll have time for just a couple, please go to one of the two microphones in the aisle, if you would, and line up there. This will give you a moment to get there. Um, we're not obviously gonna get to everybody's questions, but again, Anna will remain with us behind. So first, let me just see if we have a question from our Twitter audience, and we do. Um, question one of two from students at Christianburg Middle School. Anna, what experiences or transitions did you find with your faith? Did you lose your faith in God? Um, P.S. Our students are loving this opportunity to hear you and talk to you. So what, what did what you... I have an answer for that. I was raised to believe in God. Many of us lost their faith because they ask, why did God let happen this with the, with the innocent people? I think like that God had nothing to do with this. People did that. People did that to us. And any bad thing that happens, not God did it. People does that to, to us. That's what I believe. Thank you. Thank you. So let's see if we have anybody from our audience. Um, and if, if not, we have one here, and I think this will probably be our one question from the audience. And then again, please, when Anna's done, please come up to the stage and, and talk with her and ask her any questions that you would like yes. to then. Um, 
make your question as brief as you can. I'll repeat it just to make sure everybody hears it, then Anna can respond. Anna, thank you so much. We will never forget you. My question is, during the years of communism in Romania, were you persecuted again for being Jewish? The question is, during your years in Romania, were you persecuted for being Jewish? Say it again. During your years in Romania after the war, for the 19 years you would remain there, were you persecuted for being Jewish? Not for being Jewish, but to not be communist, to be on the list that you want to leave the country, which we did, uh, could not have the same rights or could not go the children also to higher schools, the same like the Hungarian did. So it wasn't, it wasn't a pleasure to live in a communist country because the, you had a job, but it was so little or small, I don't know how to say it, that you couldn't live with it. So you had to do something with one word, steal. And if you stole, they, if they found it, they put you in jail. And they say there were three kinds of people in Romania who is in jail, who was in jail, and who will be in jail. So uh, uh, we were very happy when after 19 years they let us out from Romania, Israel and America paid for our passports, and we were lucky that my two children was young enough to continue here the education. So uh, that's my answer. If you have another answer, uh, I have something without asking me, I would say, that when you buy a house, the agent says it's uh, location, location, location. I would say education, education, and education. Because they took that away from me and I miss it for all my life. There are so many things that I would enjoy and know if I would have the education and they did not let me do that. They took that away from us. And that's like they would take my arm from me because all my rest of the family, they were educated. But I was exactly in that age when Romania was occupied. I was 14, finishing the seven ele elementary school. So that's what I say. You have the opportunity here to have the education and that Nobody can take it away from you. And it's, it's more than millions of dollars, the education that you have. Thank you, Anna. But don't ask me one question, which I, this is not my first time that I'm here, and I had a question. I don't know, I, it was a young girl, and she asked me, could you forgive and forget what they did to you. And I said, no, I can't, and I don't want to. Because when took Jesus Christ to uh, crucify, he said that uh, don't uh, punish them, God, because they don't know what they are doing, right? But the Germans knew what they are doing. So how can I forgive and forget? This is not a small thing to forgive and forget. I will not and I won't forgive and forget. Thank you. So don't ask me that question. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> I think, I think we, are, we are ready now to close our program. Anna, thank you so very much. I thank you all for listening to me and I could talk for more than an hour, 
they made a good choice with me to talk because I was punished as a small girl who could talk too much. <laughs> so, 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 <laughs> uh, thank you.